Hi everyone, it's Mark Gracie here um, from Digital Compliance Hub. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar about um, a sort of a celebration of uh, one year of uh, the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and whilst it was tempting to make this very quick and brief and say, well, actually not much has happened in the last year, there's uh, quite a few bits that we can we can discuss. So um, I hope you find it useful. And um, just to let you know, I'm recording the session, so I'll distribute a copy of the recording um, at some point afterwards, and uh, you can uh, then uh, review at your leisure, um, along with a copy of the slides in case they're helpful as well. Um, so I'm going to so the session's booked for about an hour. Uh, if we need all that time, then fine. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions um, towards the end. So if you have any questions as we go through, or anything you think of towards the end that you want to ask about. GDPR, the presentation, um, or anything that's particularly worrying you about uh, data protection compliance, then uh, feel free to ask away. There's a questions panel um, or a questions section, I should say, in the go to webinar control panel that you should be able to see. And if you use that, I'll uh, pick the questions up um, towards the end. So um, without further ado, I shall uh, let's get things started and uh, let's start talking about uh, GDPR and what's happened in the in the last year. Um, I should have moved on to this slide um, so that you knew who was talking. So that's me. Um, I run a service called Digital Compliance Hub, which I'll talk about briefly um, right at the end. Um, but I basically work with businesses to help them with their um, data protection and uh, data privacy um, compliance. Um, my background goes back um, to when the 1998 Act came into place. That's the Data Protection Act. Uh, when I became a data protection manager for a very uh, data heavy uh, business that needed to put in place all kinds of uh, new processes and protocols around data. And, and since then, I've had a, um, a career in uh, data protection, data retention, uh, Internet uh, compliance um, and other um, sort of regulatory roles um, around that. So um, my involvement in data protection has actually been um, way before GDPR came um, on the scene. Um, but the session today is about um, a year of GDPR and the, the official uh, birthday, if, if GDPR has a birthday, um, is tomorrow, the 25th of May 2018, of course, is when the GDPR came into force. Um, and um, what I thought I'd kick off with first is just a, a sort of a recap and a reflection on what changed with the GDPR and, and what we've seen um, in terms of uh, some of the areas that um, that we've seen with regards to GDPR and what that's meant over the last year. So um, let's just reflect on GDPR and what it, what it uh, introduced uh, last May. Um, of course, it's a, a European-wide um, regulation, which means because it's a regulation in European law, that means it applies to all member states. Um, it was published in 2016 in the official European journals, which meant that uh, it was an officially a law actually in 2016. But with most uh, European laws and well, most laws in general, there's always a, an, an implementation date to enable um, businesses, organisations, those affected by the, the regulation or law to, to implement. And so that's why the 25th of May 2018 was the sort of, uh, well, some have described it as G GDPR Mageddon, um, but the day by which everybody had to be uh, GDPR compliant. And I, I guess one of the, the biggest fears sort of jumping to the end of that fan, and, and this fan is a sort of a representation of one of the slides I, I typically used when I was uh, talking for sort of almost the two years and leading up to uh, GDPR coming into force about the key sort of 10 changes. And of course, right at the end there on, on the right is fines. Um, that was one of the significant changes in terms of the amount of, uh, or sort of the size of a fine that, that could be um, could be implemented um, and so this was something that uh, spurred quite a lot of uh, sort of spurred quite a lot of businesses and organizations to uh, get their data protection in order um, because of this GDPR uh, deadline but let, let's just work, work our way around those and I'll just add some commentary on this so it's not I'm not planning on giving you a, a sort of a 101 on data protection in a, in, in, a, in a general sense but just reflecting on really what GDPR introduced and and what may have sort of um, uh, come about um, in the last year perhaps. So starting with scope, as I said, European regulation covers all member states. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody that we haven't yet left Europe, so it still applies to us. Um, I'll 
briefly touch on Brexit uh, a bit later on, um, but um, it's worth just bearing in mind that um, it applies, uh, and it, it will apply in one way or another, regardless of how we Brexit. Um, the, the tricky bit is what you may need to do, depending on whether we Brexit with a deal or, um, or no deal, or even possibly we don't even Brexit at all, in which case everything will stay, stay the same. But it came into force in the UK, um, because on the 25th of May 2018, we're still part of Europe, and, and we continue to be, so it's still relevant as the law that applies uh, in the UK. We have a Data Protection Act 2018, which implements some of the uh, what's called derogations in GDPR. So these are the things that can vary. So there are some things in GDPR that can vary from member to member. Um, things like um, the age of a child for the purposes of consent, for example, can be um, anything under 16, according to GDPR, and member states can define that. We've defined it in the Data Protection Act um, as uh, 13. Um, so those are the kind of things that are in there. There's some stuff about uh, director responsibility for compliance um, and uh, um, some of the exemptions that, are, that can exist for certain organisations who don't need to have a data protection officer, although on, on paper it might look like they should. Um, and uh, some of the things that you don't need to disclose under a subject access request, for example. But from a scope point of view, and, and the, um, the uh, EU has spoken about this actually quite recently in terms of, and, and, and actually quite regularly, in terms of their expectations about GDPR not just being a European-wide regulation, they'd actually quite like it to be the, um, the, the, the leader across the world in terms of what uh, data privacy should look like. And, there's certainly over the last year been quite a lot that has changed over the over the um, across the planet um, with different countries looking at whether GDPR like laws need to be implemented in their uh, in their uh, within their um, domain and um, I mean the California there's a privacy law that's that's coming that's um, um, that uses some of the elements of GDPR. It's not as, as wide reaching and as, as com complex as, as GDPR, but if you're doing data processing in California, for example, then you'll need to apply this. And um, there's talk of other countries implementing GDPR are like rules. So the EU, I think, are quite proud that they've um, generated this interest across the world in non-EU countries to suddenly look at GDPR as the leader of, uh, of um, good practice when it comes to data protection and compliance. Um, and so we may see more and more um, nations outside of EU rolling out EU-like GDPR um, law. And, and I think from a, a personal citizen's uh, point of view, that's that's got to be a, a good thing. And of course, GDPR has a reach outside of Europe in that if you are outside Europe and you're processing European citizens' data and offering products and services to them, then you need to apply data protection. So um, certainly there was a, a, a big movement and panic in the in the US, for example, um, for all these services that we, we may use um, where um, they needed to be uh, make sure they were GDPR compliant as well, even though they're not uh, directly governed by um, the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, moving on to accountability, I, I'm, not, I'm just going to say at this point, because I've got another slide coming up um, to sort of cover this, because I think this is, is something that is an important introduction to GDPR that um, there's been some noises made recently, particularly by the ICO, um, about its importance that um, may have some relevance looking into the future. But um, accountability for all intents and purposes is basically, um, it's not good enough that you're compliant, you have to prove that you are as well. Um, but as I say, I'll, just, I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a second. Um, there were some new rules introduced about processing data relating to children and whilst um, these were very specific rules. So if you offer an online service aimed at um, a child, where a child defined as anybody under 13 under UK law, um, that's the Data Protection Act 2018 bit I mentioned earlier, um, then uh, you also need parental consent as well. The ICO introduced um, uh, sort of a, a bit more of expansion on that and an expectation that you should be extra careful with, with children's data for, for various reasons as, as well, but the GDPR itself was very specifically aimed at if you're offering online services. Of course, the big one there in green, consent. Um, it was the thing that led to us all to suffer from uh, what I was calling consent fatigue. I think we all got bombarded by people asking us for consent 
um, to remain on email lists, um, to, to do processing that we didn't even know they were doing, or e possibly even getting a, a request to um, re-subscribe uh, to email lists that you didn't even realise you were on. Um, this was because there was a lot of noise made about consent and, and the changes with regards to um, what consent or GDPR compliant consent needed to look um, look like. And, and the, the big key thing there was, of course, that you can no longer use pre-tick boxes. You've got to be open and transparent about what it is you're asking for somebody to give consent for, and they have to take a positive action. And because of the accountability principle, demonstrate that they gave you consent as well. Um, I, th I think it's become clear and certainly working with various different clients uh, um, and uh, talking to different people that there was lots of different advice about this that some people did things that they probably didn't need to do in terms of seeking consent. There was a lot of misunderstanding about what that consent covered and under what circumstances. Um, and in the bigger picture of data protection, you've got to consider your lawful basis for processing and understand um, what is the most appropriate lawful basis for processing. And just because consent is at the top of the list, doesn't mean it's the one that's most relevant to the circumstance that you're you're processing. So if you were ever advised that you needed to get consent before you can do anything with any data, I would say that was probably bad advice. It will depend on the circumstances. If you're processing data for the purposes of delivering a service to, um, to somebody, that's your lawful basis for processing. You didn't need consent as well. Um, and also, um, I think a lot of people got stung in the marketing um, context of user consent because of uh, a sort of a lack of initial guidance and, and, and understanding that actually the privacy electronic communication regulations from 2003 sit alongside GDPR and weren't replaced by it. And if the, the PECA or the, the PECR rules say you don't need consent, then you don't need consent. So there's quite a lot of people out there seeking consent when they probably didn't need to. And I think, um, you know, a lot of action that was taken uh, in the lead up to May last year was all around this consent thing. And as I say, the, the consent fatigue we all suffered um, helped us perhaps as uh, individuals to get off a lot of uh, um, uh, mailing lists and not get um, lots of uh, unsolicited emails that we didn't know we were going to be getting anyway. Um, but um, I think it damaged quite a lot of people's marketing those pages at the same, same time. Um, the uh, GDPR introduced some new uh, individuals' rights. So these are the rights of the data subjects, the individuals whose data is being processed. Um, they've always had rights and they've, they've varied, but it introduced the, the right to erasure, the right to be forgotten. Um, so that's the, the right that says under some circumstances, you, somebody can say, I don't want you to process my data anymore. You must delete it. Um, not seen much in terms of um, activity around this. There's been some people exercising this right and and some people sort of testing the waters to see what can and can't be deleted. And, and I think um, whilst a lot of fuss was made about it being a new right, that we've all got this right to have our data deleted now, in practice, most of the time, people have got data because they've got a legitimate reason to have it, and that's a reason enough not to delete it. Um, and I always used to joke that the right to erasure is not a right to get you to delete my billing information so that you can't bill me. You need that billing information to be able to bill you for as long as you're a customer, and therefore, the right to erasure doesn't apply. And I think that's one of the things that, if anything, um, lots of businesses were not so sure about that actually it's not an absolute right. Um, and there's also the new uh, right to portability, which is a um, basically a machine readable export of the data to enable you to move your data from one provider to, to another or another service to, to, to another. Again, I've not seen um, much activity around people exercising this right, but um, it's, it's there none, nonetheless. And maybe we'll start seeing some um, sort of uh, standardization of that process um, amongst certain types of uh, sectors and, and suppliers. It also, of course, changed some of the other rules. So things like data subject access requests, it's always been an individual rights, the right to have a copy of your data and what it's being used for um, and uh, how long it's going to be kept and, and, and so on and, and various other bits of information. Um, that was changed from a um, you could charge a fee to you can't charge a fee, so you can't charge a fee anymore. Um, and you used to have 40 days to do it under UK law, but now you're down to just a month. Um, somebody asked me recently, actually, you know, what has this done? Has this changed the, the landscape in terms of um, uh, activities internally within businesses because they're being bombarded by subject access requests? I'd say probably initially they might have been because there was so much um, public uh, awareness of GDPR. So it wasn't just about businesses getting themselves compliant. It was individuals as well. 
um, understanding that they have these rights and uh, you know that there's certain things that um, they, they can expect from from people who are processing their data and then things like the Facebook and Cambridge and Cambridge Analytica scandal also helped raise awareness of the fact that there are organizations out there that might be processing data in a way that you didn't quite understand and, and there's individual rights um, associated with that so generally I think there was maybe an initial rush um, of some people exercising their right to subject access um, but I think that's probably calmed down quite a bit now um, and uh, you might have a, a different opinion on that and <laughs> if you're in an organization that has seen a, an increase in subject access and continue to see them I'd be interested to sort of hear about that um, but I think um, I think we've sort of gone back to the status quo we had before which is it's a right that you can be exercised if you want to but uh, people who were planning on on exercising it learning that they could do it for free and they had to get it you know they only had to um, they have uh, can expect it within a month um, probably didn't come to much of a fr um, uh, the fruition as everybody expected it might the GDPR also introduced and uh, this is the processors uh, section um, introduced the uh, basically the relationship between controllers and processors it, it changed the rules so it allows um, the processors to take responsibility for their processing as much as the controller but um, probably for, for most organizations the key thing here was um, GDPR basically said if you're a data controller so it's your data that you're going to be processing but you're using a third party data processor to do the processing for you you need to a make sure that they're compliant and B, make sure that you have a contract in place with the GDPR in Article 28, specifically setting out what those uh, contractual obligations um, are. And um, those contractual obligations are, are, are very specific and, and for most organisations have meant the signing or the agreeing or being part of terms and services or updating um, what's referred to as a data processing agreement. So a set contractual um, binding between the controller and the processor, setting out the rules that Article 28 of the GDPR require, but in some cases some extra stuff around how data is going to be processed and, and that covers everything from the processor only processing data on the instruction of the controller, not using sub-processors unless they've been authorised by the controller, right down to the processor um, supposedly submitting to being audited by the data controller to prove that they really are um, as GDPR compliant as they claim to be. Um, and I think that is an ongoing process for most organisations. I certainly work with organisations who are regularly looking at different third parties that might do their processes and because of the wide definition of processing and the advent of more and more software as a service or cloud-based services, there are many more circumstances now where um, data controllers or businesses are having to look at who they're, who's processing their data and um, whether they have a data processing agreement in place just to make sure that that contractual obligation is, um, is, is dealt with. The uh, GDPR introduced the concept of data protection by design and default. It, it wasn't really new to the UK because it had been best practice for quite some time under the guise of privacy by design um, and, um, and it also introduced the uh, tool called a data protection impact assessment, which is essentially a risk management uh, exercise or a risk control exercise. So um, you'd look at what you're doing with data, identify the risks, and then consider um, how you can mitigate those, those risks. The GDPR has very specific requirements when you should carry out one of these data protection impact assessments, which is typically when there is high risk processing so, uh, for example, if you're processing large quantities of special category data, so that's particularly sensitive data, health records, uh, religious beliefs, um, and, and, and so on. Um, I think that there's still a bit of confusion about whether you should or shouldn't be doing data protection impact assessments, um, not least of all because the ICO basically said the GDPR says that you should do these in these very specific circumstances and of course that means you should be doing those in those specific circumstances like the special category that I was just talking about a second ago um, but the ICO said well actually we think it should be much broader than this and if you're going to be doing something different with data or you're going to be used processing it in a different way so maybe switching to a different system um, or, um, or introducing a new system to the way you process data or a new project data protection by design and, uh, and default is a key aspect of planning that data protection compliance into that project 
but you should carry out a data protection impact assessment to highlight the risks as well. And there's an expectation that uh, in the UK, you should pretty much do that at, at every opportunity. Um, it also introduced data protection officers. So certain organisations are mandated to have a data protection officer. Um, th this is limited to public bodies and uh, companies who process uh, large quantities of special category data or um, do systematic and regular monitoring of uh, data subjects on a, on a large scale. Um, so uh, the majority of businesses, I would say, probably don't uh, need to have a mandated data protection officer, but probably have somebody, and, and this is right to do this, have somebody who is taking responsibility who they may refer to as a data protection officer. The difference is they're not just not required by law. Um, but I think that sort of highlighted for a lot of organisations that they really need to take this seriously and they should have some kind of data protection manager or data protection officer um, in place. Um, which I've done fines already really, just the increase in fines um, up to 4% uh, of global turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is the largest. Um, uh, when we talk about um, what action has taken over the last year, you'll see that we've not really touched on any, any of that right now. So um, th there's no clear idea of how big these fines are, are going. Um, but uh, yeah, that's probably all I need to say about fines. So just going back one on breaches, um, making this the last last one of that fan. Um, the ICO introduced the, uh, sorry, not the ICO, but the GDPR introduced the, the rule that uh, if you suffer a data breach where that covers everything from your systems being hacked to somebody unnecessarily, um, sorry, unlawfully getting access to your data, um, maybe because you carbon copied somebody into an email rather than blind carbon copied them, um, those are all constituting uh, a, constitute a breach. And if a breach, there's a risk to the data subjects from the breach, then you've got to tell the regulator, which is the ICO in the UK. Um, and if there's a high risk to the data subjects, then um, you have to tell the uh, data subjects as well. And I think, again, there's a lack of guidance here um, about what that actually means in reality. And we know from, from some of the statistics that have been flying around and people have done freedom of information requests on, on the ICO to understand what kind of uh, complaints they're dealing with. And um, I, I think across Europe, we came in at number three in terms of the number of breach complaints reported to the ICO um, uh, in the first eight months. Um, and I think that was in the tens of thousands. Um, I might be misremembering that figure, but um, it was certainly high and it was high in the UK, um, which is an indication, I think, from the ICO's perspective that lots of people are just erring on the side of caution and reporting everything. Um, and I know from a, a, a webinar that the ICA ran um, sort of September, October time last year, that they had seen a steep, probably five-fold increase in the number of breach reports coming into them um, since GDPR came in, and the majority of them were probably not reportable. So I think businesses are still uncertain about how to interpret what is considered risk. And, and I think a lot of that is about understanding what harm could come of the breach for the data subject to then determine whether it's something that's reportable and, and it's important to remember that actually that harm is you know not just about identity theft it's about um could be physical or, or mental um, um harm or, or damage to a person's reputation so you know if you accidentally copy in five or six customers uh into an email and um and you talk about another customer in that email or whatever or and you've got co um, CC them rather than BCC them or you included them by accident or you copy somebody by accident into an email that may have less of a rest, risk depending on what kind of organization you you are than somebody who um, perhaps works in a in a clinic in a health scenario and you're talking about something to do with a uh, you know a particularly sensitive health condition um, and you accidentally um, let everybody know who else is suffering from that uh, health condition so um, you know even though the set of people might be a small there's a different interpretation of what the damage or harm could be depending on, on the circumstances. And I think that's where the challenge lies for a lot of organisations and, and certainly uh, organisations I've worked with where they've had to consider whether a breach has occurred. You know, that's always been the concern. Is, is this something that where harm has, has, um, has happened? And ultimately, and you'll never get a straight answer from the ICO about what that might look like. 
it's about you deciding, well, I think that the harm is, is minimal and therefore I'm not going to report it and having that documented. And again, that's where accountability comes in, documenting your breaches and understanding that how you can demonstrate that you believe it wasn't reportable and that's why you didn't report it. So that was a, a very speedy recap of, uh, of GDPR. I, I could have probably spoken about those in a lot more detail, but I, I, I didn't want this to be a session of just basically telling you about data protection compliance. I just wanted to reflect on what GDPR has introduced and, and what that uh, has kind of meant in some scenarios with regards to the, the last year in terms of implementation and, and so on. I said I wanted to go back to accountability, and, and I think this is, this is probably the um, most significant aspect of, of GDPR that most, uh, uh, not most, uh, a lot of organisations are perhaps overlooking. And, and this was reflected in um, what Elizabeth Denham did in her opening speech at the uh, Data uh, Practitioners, Data Protection Practitioners Conference um, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so the, just firstly, the accountability principle basically says, if you're processing personal data, you're responsible for the data protection of that um, personal data but you also need to prove it. And um, I already mentioned various scenarios where you are proving your compliance. So the consent mechanism, proving that somebody did give you consent and that they haven't withdrawn that consent, for example, or the fact that you're keeping a, a register of what subject access requests you've dealt with so that you know if somebody says, well, you never supplied me with this, you can say, well, I did, and um, or there is a reason why we didn't supply it and, and, and so on. Or breach requests and, and, and things like that, data protection by, uh, design and default and the use of uh, data protection impact assessments are all things that fit within this accountability principle about proving that you are compliant. Um, and one of the key things that was introduced as part of that um, is, is the documentation. So it's about how, you know, how can you prove you're compliant if you don't understand what data you have across your business and also um, what you're doing with it and where you're processing it. So having um, documentation uh, around your processing activities um, is, is a requirement of accountability principle and just how much detail you need to go into and what that needs to look like will vary depending on the size of your business and, and the GDPR introduced this, this concept of 250 plus employees means you must have very clear registers and you must record certain types of information in a lot more detail than you were if you're a much smaller business but the bottom line is for most organizations you need to have some kind of documentation. So regardless of how you go about doing it, you must document your processing activities and you must document everything all the way through, all your, all your, um, all your decision makings where you've had to make uh, you know, difficult decisions. Is this something that is reportable as a breach? Is, is the fact that we're not sure whether we need a data protection officer, but based on the guidance, we don't think we are, um, and so on, are all things that you ought to have in your armory as, as documentary evidence that you've taken data protection responsibly. But going back to what the Information Commissioner Elizabeth Denham said earlier this year, um, I think whilst the conference as a whole didn't focus in a lot of detail about accountability, um, it was very clear from what she said that you know that basically um, it's a crucial part of the law, and um, and, and as she puts it, and I've quoted it there, but she's honest. She doesn't seem hasn't seen that change in practice yet. So the different bits of work they're doing, um, I'm, I'm guessing from the enforcement that they've been carrying out, which is typically under old data protection law, um, but investi investigations, um, some voluntary audits that they've carried out, and, and other bits of work they've carried out, and um, they've um, you know they've done various different pieces of um, of. Uh, research um, and they've worked with other organizations there was a, a report out um, a while ago that again highlighted that certain businesses and organizations typically were compliant but they weren't able to demonstrate that they still were compliant um, or didn't have practices in place to demonstrate that they were still going to be compliant and how they were going to check that that compliance was in place and this all comes down to the accountability so I, I, I think that uh, the accountability principles probably been underplayed um, by uh, sort of being usurped by things that are more headline grabbing, like the changes to consent, and that means you're going to lose all your marketing data and um, uh, and, and the like, and the fact that um, you know you need whether you need a data protection officer or not, or um, you know the fact that you now need to report breaches, and of course the fines, which um, at one point were being used as a 
uh, you know, a, a, a very big carrot to uh, uh, sort of encourage you to pay attention to this because the fines could be um, enormous and probably destroy your business if you were to be fined as much as 20 million euros. So um, I'm sure you're not, but if you've not been thinking about accountability, you need to pay attention to this because I think the I think we can read into what Elizabeth Denham's been saying about accountability principle being there, but not necessarily in practice. Um, as a key um, indicator that they really are looking for this documentary evidence that you're doing everything right, um, and uh, without that, you're going to get your, you're going to find yourself unstuck if you're having to uh, deal with uh, an ICO investigation or um, uh, you know dealing with your data subjects who may be uh, exercising their rights. So if you take anything from this, pay attention to the accountability principle. Think very carefully about what that means, and, and as we will talk about towards the end. Um, something I've been talking about quite a lot recently is about this is GDPR forever. This isn't GDPR for just last year. So what are you doing now to make sure that you're still compliant? And that's all about this accountability, proving that you're taking responsibility and that you are, are compliant. So that was a recap of, of GDPR and, and a little focus there on accountability. Um, so what have we seen in the last year in terms of, of GDPR? Um, and as I said at the beginning, I, you know, I was tempted to just put a slide up saying actually not much, because in reality, there hasn't been that much activity. And, um, you know, the policies that you may have put in place last year probably haven't changed very much uh, in that uh, last year, mainly because there hasn't been uh, very much enforcement. But uh, let's look at look at some of the, the key things that uh, may have changed. And I've just got a, a you know, sort of a, a hit list of things to, to consider. Um, if you haven't spotted it, um, the ICO don't do a particularly good job, in my opinion, to, to shout about the fact that they introduce much more complex guidance around particular things. Um, I mentioned about the children uh, aspect of, of GDPR and uh, what that consent for a child looks like for online services. But I also said that the ICO have a much wider view about um, taking particular care with processing children's data. And, and there was, um, the, you know, there was guidance about about that. There's been other bits of guidance about what is personal data. And if you if you look at the ICO website on a regular basis, you'll sometimes have to dig deep to find some of these things. But um, unless you go into a particular um, part of the GDPR um, section of their website and, and you suddenly see, ah, oh, they've got uh, a detailed advice about um, legitimate interest, which they probably didn't have um, in May um, last year and, and so on. So um, it's always worth keeping on top of what guidance is coming out. But as I say, um, the ICO don't particularly shout about the fact that they've introduced new guidance in a particularly uh, well, good way, in my opinion. You know, if you follow them on, on Twitter, you might pick up um, stuff uh, where they uh, say that they've now published some new guidance. But um, this slide kind of indicates, apart from the bottom two there, that the ICO have actually been quite busy in terms of sort of churning out uh, this guidance. Arguably, we could have done it with it before, uh, well before May 2018, but um, I'm sure that they were as rushed with uh, implementation as, as everybody else. Um, and then we've got the European Data Protection Board. So if you're familiar with um, how it works in Europe with regards to data protection regulations, we also all, all, we used to have the Article 29 Working Party, which was a, a requirement of the Data Protection Directive to have an, a European-wide organisation made up of all of the equivalents of the ICOs across Europe coming up with guidance and uh, and, and uh, deliberations around certain aspects of data protection. The Article 29 Working um, Party has now been disbanded and been replaced by what's called the European Data Protection Board, which is the new thing that the GDPR introduced. And so um, so they're always the sort of top level, level European Union um, um, uh, sort of source for guidance and deliberations and outcomes of uh, um, of what happens with data protection, and they've also got a role to play in making sure across Europe everybody is, um, you know, being as as consistent as they possibly can with enforcement and and and, and the like. And so it's always worth looking out for um, the EDBP stuff as well, and they've produced a number of bits of guidance, and they're usually linked through the ICO's website. So if you go to the ICO's website and look at, for example. Uh, you know, do you need a data protection officer? It will link through to some of the papers that the EDBP have published, or possibly even Article 29 Working Party before they were disbanded, um, about how to interpret what the GDPR says about whether you need a DPO or not. So um, I, I suppose saying not much has happened is probably um, 
you know, probably not quite right, but because there has been quite a, a lot of, uh, of guidance and um, there will continue to be and we will get um, more and more information, but you've got to dig deep and, and just you know, pay attention to basically keep on, on top of what, uh, what is being published and, and how that might influence the way that you've been working with stuff. And, and I think the problem here is you may be, have sought advice or you may have interpreted the regulation or what the ICO have said in a particular way yourself, um, but it all comes down to interpretation and until somebody writes something very specific that you can apply to your very specific unique scenario within your organization, be that how you're processing data or the kind of data you're processing or the kind of data subjects you're interacting with, um, it is an interpretation. So we need these um, detailed bits of guidance um, to uh, try and understand what it is that we should be doing and uh, sometimes they publish stuff and you might think oh hang on that isn't quite how we interpreted it and now you've got to sort of change your your approach so it is important you pay attention to these kind of things um, and uh, as this slide shows that they you know they, the uh, ICO and the European regulators have been quite uh, quite busy in terms of generating hopefully helpful um, guidance. Now in terms of enforcement uh, if you follow the ICO's enforcement um, practices, uh, they tend to blog about them or, or write about them, publish them on their website. It's one of the, the requirements is that they're um, open about how they've enforced certain actions. You'll think that they've been pretty busy over the last year. And, and to be honest, they probably have. There's been quite a lot for them to contend with. There was all of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica uh, stuff to, to deal with. There was the issues around political campaigning and the influencing of or the use of data to help influence uh, political outcomes and you know um, questions around what happened with the Brexit vote and questions around um, Trump getting in in the, in the US uh, from the presidency um, those, those kind of things um, you know is as much a, um, a challenge for, for the ICO um, as it is for, for everybody else trying to interpret how they're going to lawfully make use of, of data in the first place um, but in reality um, there has been very little GDPR action in terms of enforcement. And I think that that is probably more of a reflection, and certainly if you look at the ICO, um, more of a reflection that actually they're still doing, um, they're still investigating and processing complaints about issues that arise uh, arose before the 25th of May 2018. So if you look at a lot of the enforcement, in fact, the, the pretty much all of the enforcement that they published over the last year, it has all been under either the privacy regulations because it's relating to businesses who are sending unsolicited SMS or email and, uh, uh, or doing uh, illegal phone calling, um, or it's under old data protection. So the half a million fine they find Facebook around the Cambridge Analytica um, scandal was under old data protection where half a million is the, the upper limit. Um, that doesn't mean that, that nothing has been um, happening under GDPR enforcement and this slide is an indication or a summary of what has actually happened. And, and whilst, I mean, I usually say the UK have not done anything, it would be really helpful if the ICO could start um, looking at GDPR cases because that will give us a bit more information about how they're interpreting the laws. And they did actually do something relating to GDPR back in October, and it was to do with the um, political advertising um, research that they were working um, with and uh, advising on. It wasn't uh, a published enforcement action, but buried in all of the data was uh, an enforcement action against AIQ that basically said that they were doing, they had lots of data that they shouldn't have anymore and they were um, told to get rid of it. Um, that was under GDPR. That's the only thing that the ICO have enforced under GDPR to date. Um, and as you can see, there hasn't been much across Europe in general. Some of them have been high level, um, sort of high uh, awareness cases. So um, the Google case in France, for example, in January, where they got fined, I think it was 50 million euros um, for um, what they believe to be, um, so CNILL is, uh, CNIL is the French equivalent of the ICO. They basically um, took action against Google for not having appropriate transparency and consent mechanisms um, within all of their um, usage in terms of usage of their service. So the accusation is that they've buried um, consent and uh, they're doing stuff with data that people don't necessarily understand um, or are not explained to them well enough for them to know whether they should or consent and, and things like that and and i think that, that you know that even even this week there's been lots of notices around the ad tech industry and uh sorry lots of coverage around the ad tech industry and continual pushing from some privacy advocates that they're not doing enough to inform people about how data is being used 
to determine what advertising they see across multiple platforms. So that this is sort of thing, uh, sort of uh, uh, Facebook advertising, and you, you you look on something on on Amazon, and then when you look at a web page, the same things being advertised down the right hand side of the web page, as though they knew that you had already looked at those things on Amazon. Well, they do know that you've looked at those things on Amazon, and that, but there's a, a you know some questions around how lawful is it that your data is being used in that uh, in that way um, without you necessarily understanding. Um, and also there's this other issue around you sign away a lot of your rights to the use of your data because you want to use the service. And is, is that right? So I think we're going to see a lot more around that, um, be that Google, some of the social media channels or otherwise. Of course, Google are saying they're going to fight it um, because they interpret the law in one particular way, which they don't believe the um, French regulator has interpreted um, correctly. Um, so, uh, yeah, watch, watch the space on that. Um, other ones probably worth just bearing in mind is probably, I think, to be honest, there's probably one only one other one worth mentioning, and that's the Poland case, which happened last month, uh, sorry, March, a few months ago, um, which uh, was to do um, with uh, a company who had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of data records from individuals that they gleaned from various different places. I think they'd scraped some of it off of the internet um, but they'd not told the individuals that they had their data and what they were going to do with it. And, and the right to be informed says that you have to uh, be clear about why you've got somebody's data. And if you've got that data from um, not directly from the data subject, then you've got to explain where it came from and what you're going to be doing with it within a month. And the company in question did some of that activity for people that they were able to reach because they had email addresses. Um, and quite a lot of people opted out of the, of the continued processing. Um, but there were... Um, tens if not hundreds of thousands of other uh, individual data subjects who hadn't been given that choice um, and there was um, not uh, in the Polish regulators view enough evidence that they had done enough to basically try and communicate that they had their data and what they were going to do with it and I think balancing that against the fact that a lot of people who were told opted out um, of the processing is probably an indication that there were a lot of people having their data processed that they, they weren't and um, I, th I think it's been met with a bit of controversy because um, businesses are saying, but, you know, what is reasonable for us to try and contact these people and to tell them we've got their data and, and, and what's not? And uh, um, I think the fine was was a couple of hundred thousand pounds or equivalent in, in uh, Polish currency. Um, so, again, something to, to keep an eye on. So, as you see, enforcement wise, we've not seen anything. Uh, but if you sort of balance that against the kind of complaints that have, have been coming in. And this was taken from uh, a GDPR Today report um, where they, uh, I think they did a freedom of information request uh, across various regulators. And they're all at different slightly time periods. So I'm not sure this is necessarily a particularly accurate uh, uh, reflection of, of um, numbers against time. But as you can see, the ICO have had a significant number of complaints since GDPR came in. So um, I think looking at that graph and uh, looking to see the numbers that the ICO have received, and, and, and the ICO kind of talked about this at their, their conference um, a month or so ago, that they had seen a marked increase in complaints um, thanks to GDPR coming in. And the fact that we haven't had this mad rush of um, enforcement actions under GDPR because they're still enforcing under old data protection, I think it's only a matter of time that we're going to see some big cases coming forward. And I think um, the key thing to take away from, from that is you really must pay attention to these enforcement actions because I don't know whether you've ever looked in a, an enforcement action or, or um, uh, a, a, a no, an enforcement notice, which is basically you need to do something otherwise we'll fine you as opposed to you've done something you shouldn't have been do, doing and we're fining you. Um, if you need to look at both of those because buried in all of these is insight into the ICO's thinking. And very often um, it can be very uh, informative in terms of how to interpret various aspects. So, you know, everybody might think that it is OK to do something. And then all of a sudden the ICO is saying we've investigated this company for this particular action because of the, the um, complaints. And it turns out that they were doing this in our view. This is unlawful. So, you know, very often there's stuff buried in, in that and uh, um, it's worth uh, paying attention to those. Uh, it, and also the other thing, um, they're also very enlightening to understand that even though ICO have had nearly 35,000 complaints um, in a I think it was an eight-month period for the UK, um, it doesn't 
the ICA doesn't need complaints to investigate and there's plenty of um, enforcement actions taken and, and again this comes out from looking at the enforcement actions um, that indicate that it may be another regulator that brings it to the attention of the ICO or the ICO happens to see something that looks suspicious so they investigate it. Um, so um, yeah, paying attention to enforcement actions is uh, I guess my, my uh, the bit of learning I want to pass over on, on that. And um, I think just going back briefly to these enforcement actions and the fact that um, not many of them have been GDPR over the last year, it's a real shame that the regulators didn't consider what the fines might have been under GDPR for the other, other ones they're doing under old data protection. It'd been really interesting to know, you know, if the company that got um, fined because um, they allowed access to data that they shouldn't have allowed access to got a, a, a you know, a, a, a a tens of thousand pounds fine, whether that would have been rank, ramped up um, under GDPR, but unfortunately they don't do that. So we don't really know what the, the fine um, fines might look like for some of these these things other than what we've we've got here. And uh, as I said, the Polish case indicated like a 200,000 pound fine, which is probably a bit higher than things we've seen in the past, but um, there's not enough evidence there to, to give us any clues. Um, right, so, um, Time's running away. So what, what can we look forward to for the future? Now, I've, I've quoted there something that the Information Commissioner quoted, which was a quote from Alan Tur Turing saying, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty that needs to be done. And I, I think that's reflected in what I've said already. Uh, we're probably going to see more ICO enforcement. Um, uh, the uh, EU authorities are going to be taking more actions, so that's going to give us much more guidance and, and an idea of um, what the risks are to our businesses. Um, we can only hope we're going to get more guidance. Um, there's noises coming from the uh, European uh, regulators as well as the ICO around um, certification um, and codes of practice. So I think we might see a flurry of uh, industries introducing best practice around uh, data protection within their industries with the expectation that maybe that whilst they're not enforceable by law, um, they will be seen as a, um, you know, a bit of a no-no if you've got a, a, if you're part of an industry that has a code around how you process data, um, but you've not abided by it. Um, and then there's a question around proactive enforcement. Is the ICO going to be in a position to start enforcing by um, deciding to come and audit you? Um, the ICO have not indicated that that's what they're going to do, but the GDPR does imply that that's something they ought to be doing. And some of the European regulators have already started writing to companies and saying we we want to audit in your sector and uh, we're planning on, on auditing you and you need to fill out this form to, to answer some questions. So we may start seeing that. Um, it's difficult to say whether that's going to happen. As I say, the ICO at the moment are not saying that that's something that they're considering that they're more pro um, reactive than proactive, but whether um, the European uh, EDP decides to sort of suggest that that's something that should be taken uh, should, should be carried out um, is difficult to know. Uh, of course, there's got Brexit, and I've got a slide coming up on that in a second, so I won't say anything more about that. And the privacy regulation keeps threatening to happen, but at the moment is still delayed, and we don't know what that might in introduce in terms of what it means to the processing of uh, marketing data. Um, there's possibly some significant uh, challenges ahead, but um, the latest thing I saw today is that there's still some challenges that are internal within the EU discussions that uh, is, is delaying it. So um, at this point, uh, the last date I heard was sometime in 2020. If we've left it, Brexit, if we've left Europe by then, then uh, it's anybody's guess as to how that might be implemented in the UK. But uh, again, something to keep an eye on. And on the Brexit point, um, if there's no deal, um, who knows what's going to happen? It, 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 Theresa May is. Uh, basically resigned today saying that she'll be no longer prime minister past the end of a couple of weeks time um so we don't know what's going to happen with brexit any more than we did before um so in a in a deal scenario there's a good chance there's some flexibility in under us understanding what that means to data flows particularly if you're dealing with european citizens data um from the uk but in a in a no deal sort of bad case scenario um, there's going to probably be quite a lot of things that will need to be considered, not least of all because we'll be seen as a non-EU data processor. So that puts us in the same boat as countries like India and the US um, and uh, without any agreements in place. So uh, it could all very be uh, very well be a uh, restricted transfer. Um, 
I've, I've, if you look at the Digital Compliance Hub website, there's some blog posts about that, and uh, the ICO has got quite a good section on uh, what might happen or what might need to do with regards to Brexit and, and your data flows. It's worth paying attention to that as well. Um, and then, sort of looking at your, looking sort of internally at yourself and your organisation, you know, what what should you be doing right now? Well, it takes us back to the accountability principle. How do you demonstrate that you're compliant? And, and more importantly, a year on, how do you could demonstrate that you're still compliant? And and I, I can't say this enough, and I'm sure you're picking it up because um, I'm seeing quite a lot of people writing about it as well. You know, GDPR isn't Y2K. This isn't a, you know, it isn't a, a, a one hit issue it wasn't all about the 25th of may 2018 it is until the law changes again um, the last data protection regime lasted for 20 years and, and whilst then probably was a bit of a tail off in terms of people paying attention to it which then got reinvigorated with gdpr gdpr is here it's here to stay what it might look like going forward in a um with the uk outside the eu um is up for debate but is likely to be a gdpr like piece of legislation anyway um, so you need to pay attention to GDPR today so that you can prove you're compliant today as you were last May, as you were last week, as you will be next week, next month, next year and so on. So, And that's the accountability and the fact that a specific regulation, um, Article 24 of the GDPR says that you, know, you have to be compliant with the regulation but you also need to demonstrate that you are being sure that you're still compliant. So it's about checking and, and uh, regularly um, making sure you're compliant. And, and I, I, I um, I ran a webinar recently and I published an ebook around a framework for ongoing compliance, which looks at essentially 10 key things that you should be doing at least on an annual basis. And, and that list there, I won't, I won't go through it, but uh, if you want to download the ebook, there's a, a link on the, on the Digital Compliance Hub website um, that sort of talks about these in a bit more detail. But everything you probably did la leading up to last May, you need to do again, but probably not in as much detail. So refresh your employee training, make sure your policies and privacy policies are still accurate. Is the data that you're processing today the same data you were processing last year? Um, are you Have you got data that you no longer need? Should it be um, purged and, and, and so on? Um, is the relationship with your data processor still relevant? Um, has anything changed with the way you're processing data relating to data protection impact assessments? Um, you know, where your data is going to be processed, what that might mean in a Brexit scenario. Have you kept all your other data um, up to date, in, uh, sorry, registers up to date relating to consent, subject access requests and, and so on. Um, and probably more importantly, because the ICO are doing quite a lot of work on this, make sure that you're registered with the ICO. Um, there are some exemptions, but for most organisations, they won't be exempt and therefore um, checking registration is is worthwhile because sometimes they get the emails get lost because of staff changes or, or mailboxes uh, moving around um, and if you can carry out some spot checks make sure your subject access process does work make sure that if a breach happens somebody knows what to do and, and so on and uh, as I said make sure someone is taking responsibility for your compliance um, make sure you're raising as regular as you possibly can internal briefings to keep that awareness of data protection um, importance uh, flowing within your organization and, and uh, keep your senior team up to date because they're the ones that really ought to be paying attention to this and instructing you to uh, get on and do it um, and um, sometimes they perhaps don't uh, quite realize that and I, I certainly talking to various data protection officers I know that sort of senior management buy-in is always a challenge when it comes to compliance because it's not a, a, a money-making or not seen to be a money-making uh, function. Um, and just, you know, all of these things I've been talking about, what you should be doing um, on a regular basis, um, looking at what the GDPR means for your organisation, are all things that I can help with um, through the Digital Compliance Hub, and we do that in various different ways. Um, so we run a helpline uh, supported with a resource of um, uh, tools, templates, uh, compliance kits and, and, and the like. Um, we can do your data protection management for you, um, or we can just uh, give you advice as and when you need it on a sort of pay-as-you-go basis. So uh, check out the digitalcompliancehub.co.uk and find out how we can help you. And uh, if you've got any questions, then obviously uh, let me know. Um, I've run much longer than I intended, so apologies for that, uh, particularly if you've got lots of questions. But um, now's the time for questions. So if you have anything that you'd like to ask, either about what I said during the presentation or just sort of general questions about GDPR and, and data protection compliance, um, then now's the time to do it. Um, there's the questions tab in the uh, GoToWebinar 
control panel you can use for that. Um, I'll just give you a few seconds um, to ask some questions. There's nothing there at the moment, so if that's how it's to be, then uh, that's fine, and, and we'll end, end now. Okay, well, nothing, nothing's coming through. I, I don't know whether, I hope they found this session useful. Um, and if you, uh, as I say, I'll share a copy of the presentation slides and also a, record, a link to the recording. So if you do think of anything, then uh, feel free to just sort of ping me an email in reply to that and, and I'll see what I can do to help. Um, but uh, there's nothing coming through, so I'll, I shall leave it at that. Thank you very much for, for joining and to, to listening all the way through. Um, I hope you found that useful. I hope it was a bit of food for thought, not least of all, um, you know, make sure you're still compliant, um, but also just reflect on some of those changes that might be coming and, and what that means to you. And, and keeping up to date is probably one of the key things that you, you can do within your organisation to make sure that nothing's changing behind the scenes that you don't know about that could impact your data processing. And um, the, the, um, at the risk of over-egging um, and over-promoting over my services, of course, that's one of the things that I can help with as well, to keeping you up to date and making sure that you're aware of what, what's happening and what's changing. OK, well, thanks very much. I uh, hope you enjoy the bank holiday weekend and uh, half term, if that's uh, for you as well. Um, and uh, please look out for future webinars and the email with a copy of the recording. Thanks very much.